Welcome to r slash ask reddit where we answer the question, what's the scariest we need to leave now gut feeling that you've ever experienced? Our first reply is from Ambam. My brother and I were kids playing hide and seek in the front yard of our house. My brother was three and I was six. My brother was supposed to be counting to come find me, but he was taking forever, so I peeked around the side of the house to see what was taking so long. He had lost interest in the game and was standing near the front gate, which led to the street. As I'm looking, I see a brown car pull up with two men inside. The car wasn't familiar and neither were the men. They both got out of the car and approached my brother. They started asking him questions and moving closer to him. I remember feeling panicked. I had learned about stranger danger in school and I knew this wasn't right. I ran around the side of the house, flew through the back door and screamed, someone's trying to kidnap Steve. My dad didn't hesitate. He got up and flew through the front door. When the men saw my dad coming through the door, they bolted and peeled out. From that day forward, we weren't allowed to play in the front yard anymore. It's a really scary memory for me. And beneath that, we have a similar story from my toothants. I had a similar experience as a kid, but it was my cousin who saved me. We had a lemonade stand set up at the end of our driveway. I was maybe three, but my cousin was in her teens and my older brother was also with us. Some weird dude stopped for lemonade. He seemed friendly, but made a weird comment about seeing the engine in his car, and he tried to get me to come to his car door. My cousin picked me up and ran us back to the house and to my mom. Ironically enough, I live in a small town, and my mom was actually having coffee with, <laughs> with one of the local police officers in our home. The guy peeled off before we even got down the driveway, but he definitely picked the wrong house that day. Wait, hold on. This guy asked a three-year-old to come check the engine of his car? Alright, okay, yeah, that's a believable story. I also have a similar story, but nobody saved me. I'm just stupid. I was super young, waiting in the front yard for the bus to come to take me to elementary school, and this truck that's driving down the road slows down as it approaches me, and the guy in the driver's seat reaches out his hand towards me as he slows down. And I knew about stranger danger and everything, it's just I was a dumb, scared little boy and I didn't know what to do, but luckily he wasn't creepy, he was just the guy delivering the newspaper, and he wasn't reaching out to grab me, he was reaching out to deliver the newspaper. But if he was a bad guy, then I would have been captured because I was dumb and didn't react at all. Our next story is from Willowed Wisp. This story didn't happen to me, but my mom. Anyways, I was around 12 or so and my mom left to run an errand, leaving me alone. Very soon after she left, the doorbell rang. This was weird because we lived on a hill with only two neighbors. We all kept to ourselves, and we just didn't get random visitors. Thanks to some conveniently placed picture frames, I could see out the door through the reflection without being seen. I look out, and I see a young man that I don't recognize. He's dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, and something just feels off. So I ignore him and wait for him to leave. But he doesn't leave. He lingers and starts smoking. Again, this is an isolated hill. I'm alone and now I'm getting scared. I go and hide and plan to wait for my mom, except that she just left. She had a few errands to run and I couldn't reach the phone without the guy seeing me. As I'm trying to figure out what to do, my mom comes home. She runs in and asks me if I'm okay. Apparently, she got this random, go home now, urge. She hadn't even run her first errand yet, but turned around immediately. She found the guy in our yard and asked what he needed. I guess he muttered something about looking for someone or something to that effect, and my mom told him to leave. Apparently, he was acting very strangely and made my mom nervous. To this day, I have no idea what he wanted and no idea how my mom knew to come home, but I am very grateful that she did. Beneath that, we have this story from Trousers. Yeah, trust your gut. When my dad was in his 20s, he was on a trip to the beach with friends, but they only had one car. On the last day, they all pile into the car to drive home, but my dad got this weird feeling and decided to stay longer and get the bus back, even though that meant that his mom would be super mad at him because she had some work for him to do. The car with his friends made it all the way back to their hometown and was T-boned in an intersection in the main street. All four of his friends in that car died. Then this story from Risky Pete, my mom had a similar story with a thankfully better ending. When she was on a road trip with some friends, it had gotten extremely foggy out. Like, can't even see the lines in the road foggy. 
The driver wanted to keep going, but she told him to stop. Everyone in the car was annoyed with her and said no, until she demanded that they let her out if they insisted on continued driving. They ended up stopping and waiting a couple of hours for the fog to clear. Turns out, they were about one minute away from driving straight off a cliff because they couldn't see the lines. And there was no barricade on the side of the road to prevent cars from going over. Her gut instinct saved her and all of her friends that day. Lesson is, always trust your gut. And don't let anyone pressure you into ignoring your instincts. Uh, in fairness, I'm not sure if that's a gut instinct or if it's just common sense. Driving in fog that's so thick that you can't even see in front of you is just criminally stupid. Our next reply is from Lavender Acid. Me and my little sister went camping in the woods very close to our house when we were kids. We'd seen this bald guy with a blue shirt and a dog walking around, which isn't unusual for the area. You'll often see people walking and say hello. For some reason though, I just got this tight feeling in my chest. And my sister must have too, because we both just gave each other this look. I don't know what it was that made me do it, because this is very out of character for me. But I took a photo of the back of the guy as he was walking away. A while later, we see the same guy again near the lake. He comes over to us and asks us about the tent that we're carrying, where we'll be setting up, and are we camping with our dad. We say, yeah, we're going to go see him now, which is a lie. Me and my sister must have had the same moment of like psychic connection because we walked up a fork in the path until we were out of view, then looked at each other and jumped down a path hidden by the bushes and waited behind them on the parallel trail for a bit. The guy watched us walk off, pretended to play with his dog until he couldn't see us, then turned around and ran up the path after us. Thankfully, he didn't see us hidden, and he traveled the path that he thought that we had gone down. We decided camping was a bad idea and went home. That evening, my mom shows us a post on the local residence group, which is a picture of this same bald guy trying to break into someone's house. Apparently, he'd just been walking around trying people's front doors and claimed to be a repair guy when he was stopped. I dread to think what his intentions were, but it was very lucky me and my sister knew these woods so well. Otherwise, we wouldn't have thought to go down one of those hidden paths. Our next reply is from Matrix Virus. I was at a family gathering, basically a reunion, but just for family within reasonable driving distance, probably 30 people altogether. I was at a county park on a small lake that had grills and buildings that you could rent. The sky started darkening as a storm was approaching. We brought all of the coolers, chairs, balls, kids' toys, and other stuff into the building anticipating rain. The plan was to just wait it out since afternoon showers are common just about every day here in the summer. But something in the air didn't feel or smell right, even though it appeared to be just a regular afternoon storm. The hair on my neck was standing up, and I was in full flight mode. I can't really describe it. The feeling in the pit of my stomach can only be described as absolute dread. I told my wife to take my daughter and get in the car. My brother-in-law took one look at my face and asked, what's wrong? Apparently, I was white as a sheet. It wasn't even raining yet, and I was full-on panic yelling for everyone to leave that something isn't right. No one else was all that worried. They were mostly concerned with how I was acting. I went out to the car, and as soon as I was about to turn the key, the tornado sirens went off. We were not far from wherever they put those. The sirens must have been close by because they were deafeningly loud. Now the rest of the family is pouring out of the building to their cars, kids are crying, and I look across the lake maybe a few miles in the distance and I see a funnel cloud. I got the hell out of there, as did everyone else. The building that we had rented for this family barbecue thing was completely annihilated. By the end, it was literally just a slab of concrete and a lot of debris all around. It was hit dead on by an EF3. Okay, I went to go look it up. The EF scale goes from zero, which is the weakest, to five, which is the highest. So EF3 is categorized as severe damage at 136 to 165 miles per hour. At this level, roofs and walls of homes will be blown away and trees will be uprooted. And beneath that, we have this story from Small of Two Pieces. I live in an area where tornadoes aren't common. One day, there was a big storm coming. The Weather Channel had a tornado watch, which in the past, I never really put that much stock into. I don't know why, but this time was different. I was sitting in my recliner with my German Shepherd at my feet, watching the news closely. 
I felt, for some reason, that I should wrangle my cats and put them in their carriers in the basement. Worst case scenario, I figure nothing happens, and they spend 30 minutes in their carrier. No big deal. I go back to my recliner to continue watching the news when the sky suddenly turns green. Everything feels wrong and surreal. I tell my wife to get to the basement, pick up my dog, and carry all 105 pounds of him kicking and screaming down the narrow basement steps. My feet hit the basement floor, and the pressure suddenly drops. We hear a thunderous roar, and the windows upstairs shatter. Those 30 seconds felt like an eternity. Then, there was nothing. I creep upstairs and peek out the basement door to find every window blown out. The recliner where I'd been sitting not three minutes prior was completely covered in shards of glass, which I would have taken to the face if I hadn't hauled ass. It turns out the tornado went directly over our house. Our windows were destroyed, our roof was destroyed, our fence was completely gone. Our porch was ripped from the house, trees down absolutely everywhere. I'll never forget how something in my gut said to take this seriously, and listening to it saved my life. Our next reply is from Nicoli. I bartend, and years ago, I kicked this guy out because he was acting very strange, muttering under his breath that he would kill my other customers. Just really hostile. He had missing fingers on one hand, and he was kind of a bigger guy. About an hour after the bar closed, I was almost finished counting money, and just when I was about to leave, I had that gut feeling. I looked out the window, and that same guy was standing on the corner watching me in a ski mask. I know it was him because of the build. As soon as I grabbed my phone, he took off, but the cops know who he is. Now he has a vendetta out against me, and he's well known around town. This guy is effing nuts. Beneath that, we have a similar story from Overall Exam. My childhood friend's dad was murdered when we were kids in a similar situation. He managed a bar and had kicked out a young man earlier in the night for being underage. The guy left and ended up waiting outside for hours until everyone had left and my friend's dad was closing up the bar. My friend's dad was shot to death in the parking lot. It was so incredibly senseless, but I guess the guy was on kind of a murder spree and had also killed a few other random people over the span of a few weeks until he was caught. Our next reply is from Still Got It. I was freshly married in my early 20s, living in Fallbrook, California. My husband at the time was a Marine and was at work, and I was driving home from visiting family further south. In order to get into Fallbrook, you have to travel along this long, dark, and windy street called Mission Road. It's already a super dark night, around 11pm, and it's a little foggy as well. I'm slowing down and coming around this slight bend in the road, and all of a sudden, the hair goes up on my neck, and I feel incredibly anxious. About five seconds later, a young woman jumps out of the brush directly ahead of me, maybe 50 feet away on the left side of the road, while waving her arms in the air and gesturing frantically for me to pull over. I swerved a bit to the right, slowing down even further, but I did not stop. She was young, maybe early 20s or even late teens, and a little dirty, and I was immediately conflicted over continuing to drive. But something told me not to stop under any circumstances. I got further up the road, slowed a little more, and then dialed 911 with a shaky hand. The dispatcher said that she would send someone to check, but encouraged me not to feel too bad about it. Apparently, there had already been calls about this girl over the last hour, and they were unable to find her when police showed up. I heard a few weeks later about some carjacking and robbery attempts in the area. I'm very relieved that I listened to my instincts that night. Our next reply is from Danavel. I was at a state fair with my mom and my best friend. My friend and I were looking at the rides and the games. This creepy guy and his blonde girlfriend kept talking to us about taking headshots and that he was a modeling agent. He just seemed really off and really sleazy, and the girl was giving me the creeps. So I pretended that I saw my mom telling us to come, and then I grabbed my friend and dragged her off. Me and my friend are both girls, and at the time, I was 14 and she was 13. A few days later, there's a news story and rumors going around the school about two girls being kidnapped, assaulted, and murdered. They were taken from the fair the same day that we were there, just a few hours later. The creepy couple were Gerald and Charlene Galagos, serial killers. 
So I'm looking up these two people, and they were serial killers who were active in the late 70s who murdered at least 11 victims, mostly teenagers, and often kept them as slaves before killing them. Also, little interesting fact here, while both of them were arrested and tried and sent to prison, the woman of the couple is currently free. Our next reply is from Drawn Quarter. I stopped by a friend's house to watch a ball game. He, his wife, and I were just relaxing, and someone knocked on the door. It was the middle of the afternoon, and my friend opened the door because he was expecting some other people might come by also. I hear him greeting someone, and it turns out the guy at the door was his brother whom I've never met, but I did hear about. A really sketchy looking guy, meth teeth, scrawny, and long greasy hair. My friend had told me that he had a brother who lived in the area who had a serious drug problem. My buddy is talking to his brother about nothing, and the brother gets a call on his cell phone, and whoever called, all the brother told him was, not yet, I'll call you later. It seems pretty obvious that his brother has come to rob us and most likely eliminate witnesses. I look at my buddy, and it seems that he's also come to the same conclusion. Now, my buddy's wife is a no-nonsense type of woman, sweet but athletic and on the tall side. She had left the room to go to the bathroom, or so she said. She comes back into the room with a handgun, and I'm thinking, what the hell did I walk into? But she calmly says, Ron, you're strung out, and you came here with bad intentions. You need to quietly leave. If you get any ideas, my son is sitting outside in his truck to make sure that you go. Ron doesn't say a word. He just turns and goes out the door. We can hear his old pickup truck drive away rapidly. Their son, Chris, comes in and says, He's gone. I don't think he's coming back. They ask me to leave so they can decide what to do. They already called the cops at this point, who are well acquainted with Ron. The next morning, my buddy calls me. Apparently, the cops found his brother in the trailer park where he lived, murdered with multiple gunshots. They were guessing that he was in serious drug debt and had come to rob his brother. I told my friend that I was sorry, and he said, Don't be. That was r slash ask reddit, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new reddit videos every single day.